officers and officers in attendance are reminded to make full use of and speak clearly into the microphones available at all times. A reminder that mobile phones should be turned off or put on silent mode. Those present at the meeting should refrain from taking telegram calls. A polite reminder that those members of the public in attendance must not act in a disorderly or disruptive manner or otherwise interfere with the proper conduct of business. <laughs> We're watching. <laughs> right. Apologies for absence. Apologies for absence have, have been received from Councillor Geoffrey Kaufman, Councillor Balter, Councillor Ridley and Councillor Joshi. Okay. Any substitutions? And have been received, Chair. Okay. Any declarations of interest? No. Minutes of the previous meeting, may I sign? Move. Thank you. Right, item number five, reports of the Planning Policy and Development Manager. Application 210048. Five FUL, Lancaster, Newton Lane, Houston, Lancashire. We have one speaker, Helen Bradford. I'd come forward. We have five minutes, and I'll let you know when you've got one minute left. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to speak. This application seeks plan permission for the minor relocation of the approved pumping station in order to facilitate the access road between phases 1 and 2B and the provision of an additional 38 dwellings on open land phase 1 of the Woodston direction of the grower. The principle of additional residential development in phase 1 is considered to be acceptable in accordance with the Woodston direction of growth allocation and paragraph 119 of the National Planning Policy Framework in making the most effective use of previously developed land to accommodate housing need. The site currently forms part of the open space for phase one, however this parcel is inaccessible, segregated from the wider development by a tall hedgerow which runs along the full length of the western boundary and it's in poor condition. It is accepted that the development of this parcel will result in a minor reduction of public open space, however the wider phase one site continues to significantly over-provide. 6.77 hectares, excluding the drainage basins, against the planning policy requirement of 33.49 hectares. The proposed dwellings include a mix of two, three and four bedroom homes, which broadly accords with the approved mix across the wider site. One new house type is introduced, with all of the proposed house types and external materials being a continuation of those previously approved on the wider site. The proposals will have a negligible income remaining at just under 32 dwellings per hectare. The proposals are considered to be well designed, sustainable, inclusive and have full regard to the wider context within which they are located. Affordable dwellings are not proposed on this parcel as the requirement of eight dwellings is offset by an over-provision of affordable housing on phase 2A of the Wigston direction of the growth. We are content to include a commuter, a commuter sum in the section 106 should less than 20% be provided across the waste and direction of growth, as suggested by the committee reports. There are no technical objections to the proposal. Highways have confirmed that the addition of 38 lines will not cause an unacceptable impact on highway safety or the wider road networks to justify a reason for the refusal. In summary, the proposals are considered to represent high quality sustainable development that assimilates with the existing and future phases of the Wigston direction of growth. The proposals make full and effective use of land in accordance with national and local planning policy, and there are no technical objections. We fully support the recommendation of the planning officer and respectfully request that members give favourable consideration to this application. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Cosgrove. Oh, thank you, Jared. Um, first slide. Thank you. This application seeks planning permission for the relocation of the approved uh, pumping station and the provision of an additional 38 dwellings on open land within the site. The application site is located within the phase one weeks in direction for growth area, wherein the principle of residential development is considered to be established by a previous planning permission. Mm -hmm. 
Next slide, please. Um, I took one. As you can see from this slide, it's just a wider direction for growth area. And the next one, please. Yeah, and there's an aerial overview of the site. You see the roadways as it stands within the site. Next, next one, please. The rough location plan showing the red line area of, of the, the outline where this would be. And the next one, please. Yeah, that's it's so small, you can't see. I can't, I couldn't see the red line. It's all that you just see. And I've got my glasses on, so it's not like I'm blind as a bat. It is difficult. It's to very difficult for me to see any colour. So I couldn't see the red line. And it, it's it's very, very small. It's shown on page eight. There is a, Black. There is a map that shows it's yours in black and white. That. If you can have a look from here, you can't, you can't, you can't really see it. Yeah, okay. But you, you yeah, know, I know. Can't really try. Try. Yeah, at least you can see it. Thank you. Hey, carry on, Mr. Cosgrove. Sorry. I think it's, it's an issue to do with the screen resolution. Um, as you can see from, well, hopefully you could see from that, the density is acceptable. Is your microphone switched on? The overall density is acceptable. And the development provides a satisfactory level of amenity for any future occupants of the dwellings. Uh, there will be enough private amenity space provided for each dwelling to serve the needs of any future residents and would not have an adverse impact on the amenity of any neighbouring properties. The application was the next slide, please. The application also provides, uh, proposes a very minor change to the location of the existing uh, approved public station. As you can see from, hopefully you can see from that, the change is extremely minor and wouldn't have the impact, wouldn't have any adverse impacts on any local residents. Slide, please. Uh, the application uh, would propose the erection of the additional 38 units with associated access roads, parking, and private garages. The development will be accessed by a current phase one development off the roundabout on Newton Lane, which is delivered as part of phase one of the wider direction of growth. Once built out, the additional 38 units would also be acceptable, uh, accessible from the roundabout on Welford Road. The highways have already been consulted on the application, and while it's recognised that this would result in an intensification of the use of the existing accesses, Overall, it would not have any unacceptable impacts on highway safety, and highways probably are our intent that this is accept acceptable, the intensification is acceptable. They have noted, however, that the, in its present format, the new road layout wouldn't be suitable for adoption and would remain private. Next slide, please. Um, there's a material plan, I don't know if you can, you can see from this, but it just details the, the various uh, materials that are proposed to be used on the, uh, the development itself. Next slide, please. We have a breakdown of the various housing types, just giving an idea of the, the split between two, three, and four bedroom units. And then the next slide, please. Here's just we're going to run through some examples of the various housing types. Um, there's one, next, please. Next, please. And again, please, next one. And again, please. Um, then again, as was mentioned earlier by the speaker, you know, while this development would result in the loss of a small amount of public open space within the site, there is adequate open space within the overall site to meet the needs of development. Uh, so, therefore, the inspection for the um, and again, the arm is considered overall that the development is acceptable and it's recommended that five permissions uh, be granted for this development. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Broadley. Thank you, Chair. Um, you mentioned about the uh, road not being suitable for adoption. Who is going to be responsible for 
much on that road. Uh, it's one question. The, on page 15, it said about the battery set, and that uh, the most recent survey is um, necessary to be supported by the license, but that the set has been abandoned and it partially collapsed. Have we seen a copy of that survey? Um, is another question. And then, really, on page 19, item 6, uh, about the tarmac. Um, having been on some of these sites, the tarmac that seems to be put down is of very poor quality. Uh, certainly with the heat that we've had, uh, but even prior to the heat, you know, you get cars doing a three-point turn and the tarmac's all broken up as before um, even a year's up. So can we put in there that it's good quality? Because um, I understand that these... Um, parking bays and the little cul-de-sacs uh, that go with them. Um, it's the residents that are responsible for it. So, you know, can we have good quality? The other thing, it, um, have we got any details on the lighting on the scheme? Thank you. Cosgrove? Oh, just to ask the question to turn. In, in the first case, in terms of the maintenance of the roads, uh, road there will be level of trouble. In terms of the said yes, I've seen evidence um, of that being closed, and that is acceptable. Um, in terms of the condition on the, the drive, I believe that would be covered under the building regulations and might not be a matter for planning. So we can certainly discuss. Um, discuss that matter and no uh, lighting is not an issue that we have uh, really considered in this one because it would be a residential state with suburban quality. Sorry, can I just come back on the lighting? Um, Presumably some on this, uh, these 28 houses, they're going to be like in a cul-de-sac. Is the lighting provided in these cul-de-sacs or is it just on the main, uh, on the main Road. Again, through experience, I know that some sites don't put uh, lighting because the state residents are responsible for it. But then these places are pitch black, and obviously, uh, antisocial behaviour can take place and all sorts. So it's knowing where the lighting is that I'd like to be told a bit more about, please. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cosgrove, could you just and also have the police? put any um, contribution into regarding antisocial behaviour prevention? Uh, first of all, I don't have details of the, the lighting um, at this stage. Um, that is something that could be, could be looked at. Um, the police response was something that they were secure by design measures for the actual dwellings themselves, and they didn't seem overly concerned about antisocial behaviour that didn't come up as an issue. And on to your questions, Councillor Brogan? Well, not about the lighting, no. really, but... <laughs> I think we need to have a think about the lighting. Councillor Lloyd. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, I'm really disappointed that we've got this application before us um, at present, because I'm concerned about what's going on here. We had an an application back in February 16 for phase one for 450 houses, which was passed. March 20, we get another application for an additional, additional 32 houses, which took that number then up to 482. We've now got another application on phase one, in phase one, for another 38 houses, which takes us to 520. Now, had that application for 520 come to us at the beginning, in its entirety, it would have triggered a different set of planning conditions and rules and regulations. But because we've had this done in three stages for phase one, we can't any longer look at it as a whole. In other words, we've got piecemeal planning here. And that is very frustrating for planners, for councillors and for residents. 
It really is annoying. So I'm displeased that we've got yet another application come in to extend the number of houses in phase one. We've got to suck that up, we've got to accept that, but it's wrong. Are we going to see that in phase two, when we've got 650, which will then be another addition later on, and another addition later on? I'm very angry about that. Secondly, I'm angry that because we've got this now additional 38 houses, taking up this space of land, open space, we're being told that there's sufficient open space in the phase two to cover the loss. So what happens in phase two when they come back with additional houses to cover some of the open space and there are more additional houses taking more additional open space? Can we put a stop on any more open spaces being used to squeeze more houses into phase two? I suppose you're going to say no, we can't. Thank you. I can't think of a reason to refuse it just on that, but if it was left up to me, I would. Because open space is vital and we're losing more and more and we're being told it's all right because there's more in phase two. Well, I can see phase two coming back in the same way as we've got this here, with extra houses being put in. So second reason, I'm not happy. And when you look at the actual application, first of all, my biggest bugbear, there's not one bungalow in this lot of 520 houses. Opie and Wigston is desperately in need of bungalows so that our housing can be moved on, so that people with families can move into three-bedroom houses, which at the moment older people in Opie and Wigston are sitting on because there's nowhere else for them to go. There are no bungalows. If you go into South Wigston or the Fairfield Estate, if a bungalow comes on the market, it's gone within two or three days of it coming in the, on the market. And we see no bungalows in this. And I bet we see no bungalows in phase two. So that is the reason I'm extremely cross. The badger set's already been mentioned. Go back to this unadopted road. It's not acceptable. We have had situations where we've had un roads being unadopted by the county. Usually that means there's no lighting. So residents are moving into a property with no lighting. It means that Refuse and recycling cannot be collected because the roads are not suitable to take our lorries. It also means that if they are not adopted, those residents living in those 38 houses are going to have to find the money for any future repairs to the roads. So, not having this road adopted is just not acceptable. We should not be permitting planning going through without the roads being adopted by the highways and being in a suitable situation, a suitable condition with sufficient lighting to allow our residents to live without additional costs in the future. And I don't know at the moment, and I'm going to be told that that is not a sufficient reason for refusal, but it should be. In the planning, uh, in this application as well, 
There is also concerns about the bus route. Now, I know that we have a bus route going round this phase, phase one. We did ask for the bus lanes to be alcoved out to stop any congestion with people going in and out of the site. Can this be put into this phase here so that any bus, buses going round this have to come off the road into a bus lane, a bus alcove, to stop congestion of any cars? Look along here at Wigston, and I know South Wigston is not the same as these 38 houses. But every time the bus stops, everybody has to stop behind it, or they then put in a dangerous situation of overtaking the bus with oncoming traffic. So I'm not happy about no bus lanes being in this area. And finally, is it possible to have a condition put on that when these properties are built, because of them, they are not allowed to pave over their front gardens? Page 16, it talks about this is the flood zone and the risk to damage. It talks about surface water drainage and I wondered, we see time and time again people moving, everything's paved over to get the extra cars off the road and this encourages surface flooding. So is it possible to have an extra condition put on that the properties are not allowed to block pave over grassed front areas and gardens. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. You asked quite a few questions there. Um, I believe we'll have to go to various people to get the answers, but just running them through. When you're talking about adding buildings on, like the 32 and the 38 and whatever, and then we've got phase two coming along, I believe we've spoken before about this is all Cumulative, it all adds up, and it all becomes the same project. So all those things that you're talking about, like schools and shopping centres, whatever, already come in. So that's, is that correct? <clears throat> that's correct, Joe. You look at the overall development when it's going to be finished. So the point that Council Lauder was making about additional uh, applications and phase two for additional housing, there will come a point on that site when the open space does not meet our criteria. So any applications after that could be legitimately refused on the basis that there's an impact on the immediate value of people. So there are things there. You spoke also about the adoption of the, the road. The bottom line is, unfortunately, we cannot dictate to county what roads they're going to adopt. And it's as simple as that. In terms of what we are doing, there was a report that went to PFD in uh, June, which is a new supplementary planning document in regard to waste, storage and collection, a guide for developers, which the developers now have to comply with. And that deals with issues about access for our vehicles, making sure that the road, uh, or the roadways are sufficiently strong so that our vehicles can go onto them and they're not being damaged, or they have to provide collection points at particular areas so that we can get in there um, and, and make the collection. Um, the other point you made about bungalows, at the end of the day, it's an open market. If developers make more money building houses as opposed to bungalows, then developers will build houses. And unfortunately, there is nothing as a local planning authority that we can do to insist that, for instance, 15% of all uh, units on a development have to be bungalows. I believe that is coming in on our emerging local plan, though. We are bringing in the provision of bungalows. Mr. Carl, you're not in your head. It is something we're definitely looking into in terms of gathering the evidence base 
to then enable us to propose a policy in the new local plan that it looks at provision of bungalows on, on these development sites. Chairman, can I come back, yeah. please? Um, thank you, Mr Gill. Um, I'm, I'm still concerned about this um, open space business because it says that in, in somewhere in this report now, it says that they are, the developers are coming back with 106 agreement money. But this is to provide an upgrade of facilities outside the area. So we want facilities in the area and we don't want it over the period of phase one and phase two to go, to be, to be decreased and then 106 money being paid for us to increase or improve the parks outside the area. That's not good enough. They should be within the area. And this bit about bungalows, I don't, we should, as a planning authority, be insisting that developers provide what is needed for the residents of this borough. We already have a policy in place which says that housing will, will meet the needs of the residents of the borough. I don't know what the number is, you will know that, but that policy already exists. And at the moment, they are not meeting the needs of a considerable amount of residents of this borough. So I know we are thinking about it. I'd like to have a little bit more positive, definite idea on that, because we've got the evidence. Odeby and Wigston has long been known for an area where older people migrate to live. Now, I'm finding older people coming to us and saying, sorry, we've had to go to Cosby, we've had to go to Weston, we've had to go to Blaby to find something which will meet our needs. Odeby and Wigston can't meet our needs any longer. So we should be insisting that we do that with developers now. I just Gil, think you want to come in? I appreciate uh, your views, Council Lord, and it is a book there. But as monitoring officer, my role is to advise Council what it can do and what it can't do in this committee. And I think a policy, even an SPD, that insists on bungalows being built as part of uh, development is bound to fail and would rapidly find itself in the High Court being challenged by developers. Um, it's, I think it's a question of working with the developers as opposed to dictating to the developers. So there needs to be a conversation and it appears that Mr Carr is already working on that going forward. If we can just go back to the issue with regard to open space, on page 13 of the report, it talks about the amount of open space that's going to be available across the whole site. It's third paragraph in the bottom. Overall, the site provides 15.37 hectares of open space. The formal requirement is 3.5 hectares. So this loss of this, this space on phase one will be more than compensated for in phase two. If there is a financial contribution on the 106 for this, on the phase one, then we can make sure that it is conditioned so it is applied across phase one and phase two. So we can address those issues through the Section 106 agreement. Um, I say, the officer has said that his view is that the, the proposed loss of open space does not of itself render this application one that could be dismissed on that basis. So Chair, when we come to phase two, and I know it is hypothetical, and they increase their 620 houses to seven, eight, whatever, and we lose the open space in there, we can actually at that point say no, we refuse the application. Well, down the way, we'll have to come back at a set, as a separate application because we've already given, been given outline permission for that amount. They can't increase it without having additional planning permission. 
Uh, and that's the point I made earlier, Councillor. There will come a point, if we have this continual attrition of bits being added, there will come a point where the officers will take the view that there is insufficient open space across the whole of the development, and that would be sufficient to found a ground for a refusal. But looking at this site and looking at the amount of open space, it's quite clear from, from what the agent said, a lot of the open space is not capable of being built on because there's a hedgerow and it makes it difficult. So I have no concerns that if, this, if members are minded to approve this um, application, that overall there is sufficient open space to meet the requirement that we have. Okay, there was one of the thing you were talking about, putting a condition on houses that no building could be put on. I believe there's already legislation in place yeah, regarding be. that for having to have planning permission for a non-permeable surface in front of a house. Could you confirm that? Yes, just very quickly, my friend Google, um, it does say there are some instances where you need planning permission for a block paving driveway. If your paving is not made of permeable materials, they do not meet the regulations under the government's sustainable urban drainage legislation. Albeit you can have clay, block, clay blocks because they tend to be less porous than concrete. So basically that is already in place. It's just, if you walk around our borough now, there are a good percentage of properties that are completely paved over and it does not seem to be monitored or regulated. Okay. Are you happy other than that? <laughs> no. Councillor <laughs> Morris. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I fully agree with everything Councillor Lundin said there? He's saying what was in my book And then you've answered some of the questions I had. So thank you. And my faith one now shows by the part we have. We know the part we have, we've got to go about it in the early years. And we know they don't phase two until we get to school until we get rid of it, because, as I've said many, many times since 2016, Typhoon, Meadow, how are they going to take all of these? You know, when we sat and discussed this in 2016, and it was 450 hours, which we knew it was 450 because it was below the 500, we knew, we knew that it would get them their houses built. So at the moment, they're now playing the stack them high game, because how on earth in 2016 did you not know you could fit another 70 houses on. That's magical. In the space that you could get 450, you've now found space for another 70. Not three, four, five, or six, 70 houses, three, four, five bedroom houses. That's some serious amount of space that you're suddenly taking. So can we put pause on phase two and say that we want our school? Because the schools cannot that. take it. We've already given permission for phase two. We cannot stop on it. No. Oh. Can we do something? Oh, permission oh. gives the permission. Can legal look at something to get the school built? The primary schools cannot come. What are we going to do? Have mobile homes, just mobile classrooms put on the, on the playing fields to shorten the playing fields, clear some more of the school's playing fields, just to cope with all of these additional children? Because you're telling me that there's not going to be a load of children that come into these, what is now, what, 520 houses? There's no, no children that need to go to primary school out of 520 houses. Once if there's two per house, where are they going to go? Because the Meadows is landlocked. Tythorn has a field behind it with sheeping currently next to the train tracks. But where are these kids going to go? Are we going to get another 650 houses on top of this and then tell them to build a school? Where are the kids going to go? Can, can they, can we just take them? Or have we got to send them to the city? It blows my mind that we're going to have all of these houses and we can't put the kids into school. Do we have 40 kids in a classroom? 50 kids in a classroom? Because then the schools have got to get a teaching assistant, not a teacher, a teaching assistant, because they can't, we can't have more than over one teacher per 31 kid. Where, is it, where does it end? If we don't stop it now, do we have 1,000 houses and no additional schools? 
do we just let that go? Because we've got to do something now. Whether that's the planners... I'll just get a legal opinion. Legal. Mr Gill. Thank you, uh, Chair. I'm just looking at the guidance that's been issued by the Department of in respect of the provision of schools and the responsibility of ensuring that the management and delivery of the schools is forthcoming is actually the role of the Education Authority, which is the County Council. And therefore, it's for the County Council to take the appropriate steps to make sure that at the appropriate time, the, the school is delivered. We, as a planning authority, do not have the power to, to require the county education authority to do something uh, like that. Um, I appreciate the frustration, but the argument will always be that you can't have a contribution until you've actually sold the houses that should be built. And that's, so, um, yeah, but, but it's, it's a circular argument, isn't it? but that's a view that generally the developer would put forward. So as it stands, it's county's responsibility. Turn it back then. What can we do from a legal point of view? Because this is beyond the joke. It really is ridiculous that you can, you can allow a thousand houses and no additional school. Can I just clarify exactly what it is that you want this committee to do? I, I, I don't, I, well, can we, put, can we turn this down? Because, it, you know, you've taken open space away, they've, built, they've found a magical number, no, no, another 38 houses that they couldn't find in 2016, on top of the 32 that they managed to find. There's no, no proposal for when this school's going to be built. You know, will my children have children by the time it, it's been built, you know, the school? Will my kids kids go to this school? Or do we do something now? Or do we allow for mobile classrooms to be dumped on the Meadows playing field or Tython's playing field so that we can house the kids, so that they can get an education? Or do we allow the classrooms to have 50 kids in it so the kids don't get a proper education? We have a responsibility. So whether it's a planning responsibility or a legal responsibility, We've got to make... Because okay. David Wilson Holmes don't yes. care. They, they're interested yes. in selling their house. I'll give you a legal opinion on this, but I'll just say something first. It is within the gift of this committee to approve or disapprove. Yeah. My advice, having read through this, if you do not approve this and go with the officer's recommendations... The applicant has the right to, to appeal. You know that. They will go to appeal. And they'll win. We will lose. But we're losing anyway. We will get cost cut against us, I would think. And we would open up our local plan to speculation. Mr Gill? I fully understand that. Mr Gill? Thank you, Chair. I think the issue, is, in reality, is not a legal question. It's a political question. And the way that you resolve it if you want to resolve it, is that you raise the matter and make sure that the legislation is changed so that you get what is required. As it stands at the moment, county perform their functions, which is statutory functions, and they comply with the legislation. It is their responsibility to provide the schools at the time that they consider it to be appropriate. As a planning committee, it's your responsibility to apply the planning legislation, the planning guidance, the case law and the SPDs and make an informed decision. And as the chair has just said, and I'm going to reiterate everything that he's just said and agree with him, from a legal perspective, there is no basis on which you can refuse this application. It might be difficult, might be uncomfortable, but I give my warning, just as the chair does, if you refuse, the applicant is likely to appeal on appeal, you are likely to have been found to be unreasonable because you are addressing issues over which this committee has no control. Right. Uh, I understand that there is a member of the public that is from David Wilson's home, hence that I am talking through you, expressing my concern, mm -hmm. and that David Wilson's homes are listening and are sympathetic and understand what it is. And if I don't air those issues, how would they know? Therefore, I know about turning down things. They've got us over a barrel. They don't want it. Well, anyhow, so if we refused it, what would that actually change apart from it cost us some money? So they've got us over a barrel. Hopefully, the, the member of the public is listening. He's sympathetic to the cause for children to have a good education, have schools to build, and takes that back. But, you know, I've realised building things, but if I don't say it, 
would anybody else? I've been raising it since 2016 when we were so over the road. <laughs> right, so it's still banging on the that same point. So I'll leave that one there. I wanted to talk about the pump station road. And if we could bring that picture back up of the pump station, it's not the moving of it, it's the road that I just want to just, just want to ask a quick question on. Fly eight. <laughs> no, <I'm sorry. laughs> but the question the question I've got, so if you look at the road there with the pump station. If you look at the top right of the picture, where's that going? Because it says temporary road, but why do we need that temp? Where, where is it all going to go? You've got the top bit, you've got it going off two places, and you've got obviously cut off. Why do you need that if it's not going anywhere? Close Grove. I think it is. If you look, have a quick look. If you look at slide five, you've got a better idea of where that curve goes. You can't, you can't see that from it. <laughs> it's not so fine. It's just, it's, it's just not a good old pig, unfortunately. I don't want to be doing this. That's not so fine. I'm sure all of the road you can see it's not, it's not a good old pig, unfortunately. I think you'll find it's the continuation of the road interface too. So why does it say temporary? Because it's temporary road at the moment until it's open to phase two. <laughs> But it isn't temporary then, Chair, is it? That's my point. Where is it going? Why is it a temporary road? Because temporary to me wouldn't need those bits. It's, it's going to be a road. So say, say what it is, it's going to be a road. And that's why it's been, don't call it temporary because temporary doesn't last. You find these sort of roads on every development across the country. I'm not saying all future accidents. Give us information, don't tell us it's something that it really isn't. It might be temporary now. But tell us, it's I'll a temporary road. Told it's a temporary road surface. For the, that's going to wear away. Right. Right. Oh, okay. okay. I think it could well be a temporary road surface that they use to do the development, and then when the development is finished, it will then become a proper road. Why can't it say that? Because at this moment in time, that is an accurate description of it. It's a temporary road. So why does it need to be like that if it's a temporary road? Let's just let's change it then, as it only needs to be the temporary bit for where it's temporary, and then when they need the other bit, they can build that. It does actually say on the slide on the left hand side that it's future access. Yeah. I understand. Like, what you call it and re read that, that to me, feel free. I understand free. what you're saying, Councillor, but it's, it's <laughs> not really relevant. But it is, <laughs> because it's not a temporary road, is it? It's going to be something else. It need, we need to we'll say it as it is. Until it's a proper road. Tell us that. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Councillor Morris? I'll let Helen go. <laughs> Councillor Lloyd? Yes, thank you, Chair, for letting me come back. And I know, I realise that we can't go anywhere with a refusal. There isn't sufficient grounds to refuse it. But this is part of the frustration, isn't it? That we are here tonight, we're trying to go politely as officers who are just as frustrated as we are over what's going on. And we know, as, as Mr Gill has said, that this is a political situation that we find ourselves in, which we, again, can do nothing about. Our developers have the upper hand. They know every which way to turn to get exactly what they want. And we like to think that they are listening. But time and time again, we found, find that the pound sign is the only thing that the vast majority of developers are listening to. It's profit. And we and residents are left. We know if we go for a refusal, they'll take us to appeal, they'll win the case, we will get surcharge. And at the end of that, that's our residents and the money for this borough that is going to have to be paid somewhere. So we're on a lose lab straight away. But we have to voice our frustrations at this meeting. <coughs> and I'm sorry, I apologise to officers who have to take it and come back at us. But developers at some stage have got to listen. I allow we get a change of government that listens, hopefully. Thank you, Chair. 
I agree with you about the change of government, but change to what? <laughs> okay. Um, we've got no more speakers. So can I ask a couple of questions? All right. This development is to the, if you're looking uh, to the right hand side. And there is already an existing road there up to a single dwelling, privately owned, I believe, at the moment. And this development crosses it in three places. I'm not worried about this development having roads crossing private land because that's, a, that's between the individual and the developer. Uh, it's well known that we can give planning permission on somebody else's property, but whether or not they can implement it is down to the individual who owns the land. My main concern, though, is that existing road has direct access to Cook's Lane. Can we be assured that if we do permit this, and it does go ahead, if the individual gives their permission, that that access to Cook's Lane will not be direct access from this development into Cook's Lane with no restrictions. Because as we've said on phase one and phase two, Cook's Lane needs protecting. And we cannot have traffic from these developments going directly onto Cook's Lane. So can I be assured that that access will not be maintained? Mr. Cosgrove? I don't believe that access is proposed on the drawings that are in front of us today. It's there though, it's existing. It's there now. And those roads that are proposed will directly cross an existing road. And that existing road has direct access onto Cook's Lane. I need to be assured that those houses or any houses on that development will not have access directly onto Cook's Lane through that road. Someone needs to answer that. Mr Carr? In terms of access, highway access onto Cook's Lane, as far as I'm aware, it's dealt with as part of phase two. So the phase two development, the red line, would have included Cooks Lane. And I know that was discussed just part of phase two, phase two B, and, and, and not using Cooks Lane as a, an access onto Welford Road. Hence why there's the, the mm -hmm. access, the roundabout access on Welford Road. So it, it's not as as Mr. Crossgrove said, it's not part of this red line, and I'm, I'm not saying it, it, it just bound it, but the Cooks Lane element is part of the sort of wide, wider direction of the growth area in phase two, two B. So you can assure me that this road will not have direct access onto Cooks Lane. It will be closed off. Silence. Can I have a condition imposed on this development then that that existing road will be closed off? Mr Gill. May I suggest, Chair, that you actually have the opportunity to defer this item to give me the opportunity to find the Phase 2B report that went to committee because I'm sure that that contained information about Cook's Lane. So we, if we perhaps just park this for a few minutes and, and give me that opportunity. It phase, the phase two outline planning permission did have Cooks Lane as a protected area. But this is a separate application apart from phase two that is crossing that particular road. And I believe it needs looking at. I'm quite happy to defer it. For, do you want it deferring for five minutes? Yeah, if you, give me, if you give me five minutes. In fact, if you want, perhaps want to move on to another item. Okay. And then we'll come back to the councillor. Morris wants to. So, councillor Morris. I was going to say, um, I can't recall the application from memory. Sorry. But 
we've previously had it where one sub, the next application overrides that one. And if we're not careful, does this application, don't you want to say it, override the previous information for the phase two? Because I'm sure, and Councillor Lloyd will maybe remember it, we've had one where it's come back and they've gone, ah, well, you made this decision which overrode that one, and it's the last decision that you made. And if we're not, um, yeah. so that's what I was saying. If I want to be, want to be really careful that. If we say, oh yeah, go on this, then suddenly we, I'm not sure they've got around the cook lane issue yeah. that you write a book. Because I do remember it with the bolt, they blocked it off. But if we give this, does that suddenly go, uh, go ahead of that one and wipe off the previous one? We've yeah. done? Okay. Is the committee happy for me to defer this whilst we look at the next application? All those in favour of deferment? Okay. We will then look at the next application and come back to that. Need me on this next application, so I'm just going to step outside and do this. It's okay. Mr. Gill's going to do some swapping. Okay, so the next application is 2200112 FUL 52 Fell Mill Road, Wixton. Mrs. Carey. Thank you, Chair. Um, the application to put two storey side extension, single storey front and rear extension, and incorporates the existing garage that uses habitable accommodation as part of the overall scheme. With regards to the design of the proposal, within the adopted residential development supplementary plan document, it states that the council will not use this as side extension and we either set in by one metre from the boundary or when this is impractical, we assess the first floor level by a metre behind the front wall of the dwelling. So that visual separation is created in order to avoid the toasting effects when the street seems. The side extension as submitted is set back at first floor by a means up, which in turn reduces the ridge height and therefore complies with this element of the supplementary plan document. The front extension proposed is in line with the neighbour's portion of the 52A railway road and sits behind the building line created by the dwellings to the east, which sit at least five metres forward of the application property. As a result, it's not considered that the proposal will significantly impact on the character of the it should also be noted that there are a number of similar two-store side extensions along the street of Fellmill Road and into the neighbouring streets near Road and Grassley Road. Further confirming the developments of the nature of the two communities and developments in the area. And some of the other existing developments displayed are on the photographs within the presentation. The supplementary planning document also requires development to comply with the 45 degree code of practice to lessen the impact and to protect the neighbours most likely affected by the proposal. In this instance, the development incorporates the existing garage along the boundary of 52 a Bellmere Road. And whilst the proposal does not extend the development in this location, there's a slight increase in height. However, due to the existing garage and rear extensions carried out at number 52A, which runs parallel to the application site, the proposal complies with the 45 degree code on this property. The opposite neighbour at number 50 Bellmere Road has a conservatory in the rear, running parallel to the proposed rear extension. As such, the proposal complies with the 45 degree code on this neighbouring property. As a result of existing developments either side of the boundaries, it's not considered that the proposal will impact on the residential amenities of the neighbouring properties. Concerns have been raised within the representation received regarding the impact of the side extension on the neighbour's kitchen window, which is located in the side elevation which faces the two storey side extension. The supplementary planning document is quite clear that when assessing the impact of developments on neighbouring properties, it's assessed from the front of the windows only and not windows in side elevations. However, the neighbour's concerns have been noted, and although the proposal complies with the council's adopted policies, Officers have sought an amendment which replaces the gable roof with a hip roof to reduce the impact of the neighbour's window. The applicant has agreed to amend the design and the advice plans have been submitted and not displayed on the screen so far. The proposal increases the number of bedrooms from three to five, increasing the number of parking spaces required from two to three. A plan showing four spaces across the front of the site has been provided and as such it is demonstrated that sufficient parking can be provided on the site. In summary, the proposed development is not considered to have character and appearance of the existing property in the surrounding area. The immunity of neighbouring residential properties or the safe and efficient use of the highway and is therefore recommended for approval subject to the conditions outlined in the report. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you very much. Do you have any speakers? Mr. Broadley. Thank you, Chair. I called the application into this committee after visiting the street. While some properties do have double storey side extensions, there are none with front extension. I feel that the front, rear, and side extensions are an overdevelopment of the site, not in keeping with the street scene. It is a unique property because there's only one shape like it, and I think it will set a precedent in the future. I'm pleased that the side extension has been stepped back. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Broadman. Anybody else? Councillor Lloyd? Chair, um, we've got a lovely thing there. Are we actually going to see the plan? Can we see the plans, please? Yeah. I think on my presentation, the floor plan is... Slide 19. Oh, that's the, yeah, there you go. That's the first floor plan. You can see that the two story side extension is set back a metre at first floor. You can also see from the roof outlines on the first floor proposed plan there that the front extension is actually in line with the neighbour's porch. And the rear extensions there, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, I've just not got it on. <laughs> and the rear extensions that are Currently, they uh, are replaced to some extent existing rear extensions on the site anyway. Um, the development to the right at the rear, the single storey element, is actually the footprint of an existing extension. Um, so it's only really a slight increase in depth on the left hand side that's an addition of the rear to what's already there. So I think the next slide probably shows the ground floor in a bit more detail, or the slide before. Oh, that's the outline of the ground floor. Um, like I said, you can see this uh, single storey rear extension in relation to the neighbour's extensions on that plan a bit better, um, which is why you can see that it does actually comply with the 45 degree code at the back. Right. Can Councillor Lloyd. Councillor Lloyd. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, can we just see the plan of the, the visual, the front um, elevation? Uh, yeah. Just move a few. That's it. That's the front elevation on the street. It was initially proposed as a side gable, but obviously, like I say, we sought a revision to amend it to a hip. So at least. Um, lessen some of the impact on the side facing window for the neighbour. Um, yes, thank, thank you. Um, Chair, I, I, I can't really see that it is significantly different. What I do have a concern about is that driveway. Because as I was saying earlier on about driveways, that is block pain. Now, it might be permeable. Um, with the drainage, because it says that here. But what is happening is that the whole thing has been paved over. I thought our policy, somewhere in the policy, it could only be a small, a, a small amount had to be left unpaved. The whole thing's been paved. And when this happens, with the cumulative effects along the street, when you get heavy rainfall, you get flash flooding and that's one of the reasons why we brought in a policy um, a number of years ago that we should not block pave the whole of the front of driveways because we cannot prevent flash flooding when, when residents do that and I noticed that that has been done here. The whole of the front has been paved to enable those four cars to get onto the four car. Um, can that be looked at, that design be looked at um, and be assured that there is considerable work done that will allow any heavy rainfall to stop rain being sent onto neighbouring properties, which is a problem that we suffer from, from our neighbours. 
Is, Gary, is there anything that can be done regarding that? Um, I think, as mentioned by Mr Gill earlier on, unfortunately there are permitted development rights that allow people to do that, providing it is a paternal form of zoning. So, to some extent, our hands are tied in what they can and cannot do. They are showing on the plans that it's permeable and there is a drainage channel. Um, so, to all intents and purposes, that is actually permitted development. Can we please, though, check our policy? Because I am sure that policy says that you cannot cave over the whole of the front. It has to be a certain percentage left unpaved. Can we just have that policy checked, please? That's not a problem. We can, we can check, check that. Yeah, we can check that. We can check that. Are you happy that they come back to you on that? Okay. Any other speakers? No? Uh, in that case, I will move the proposal to permit from the chair. Do I have a seconder? I'll second, chair. Councillor Lloydon. It's been moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Lloydon. All those in favour favour of permit? Four. Any against? Any abstentions? One. Okay. The application is permitted. <coughs> Thank you for that. Can we now move back to the previous application? Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the opportunity of uh, looking at the paperwork. So, um, in respect of Cook's Lane, um, the previous application that was considered by uh, this committee on the 20th of January contained a number of conditions in relation to Cook's Lane to make sure that vehicles passing over it could not turn left or right and use it as a through access. So that guarantees it and I uh, have no issue there. With regard to the talk, the issue around the house and the path, the agent had the opportunity of speaking to me outside. The, the path that leads down from Spring Cottage Farm or whatever it is, is actually going to be diverted into phase 1B and most of it is going to be dug up because that's where the houses are going to be built. So effectively, there will be no through route down that track. It will have to go through and through the estate. Including the last little bit that connects to Cook's Lane. Well, there'll be a load of houses in between, so, okay. so you, you won't be able to... As long as I'm assured, yeah. and it's minuted in this meeting, yeah. that yeah. that road will no longer exist, yeah. I am right. happy with that. Okay. So, moving back to that, do we have any more speakers on the first application? No? Okay, then I will move it from the chair to permit. <coughs> Councillor Broadley will second it. So it's been moved by myself to permit, seconded by Councillor Broadley. All those in favour of permit? Regrettably. Five. Any against? One. No abstentions, so that application is permitted. Thank you. Moving on. Application C. Thank you. 220147 REM. 21 Willow Park Drive, Wigston, Leicestershire. Mr. Cosgrove. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> See if we can get the slides. Right order. Um, yeah. Again, I'll move to the next slide. The application site is located on the east side of Willow Park Drive and contains a two story detached dwelling situated on a large L shaped plot. The area is characterised by immensely detached and semi detached dwellings constructed from brick in a range of styles. The application plot is larger than average and access to the highway would be via the existing drive to the side of the plot. There are a number of protected trees protected on the TPO number 0209. Um, located on land to the rear of, but not within the site. These trees would not be affected by the proposed development. Next slide, please. As you can see, the, where the red dot from Google is, this is the plot. You can see it is considerably larger than the, uh, the surrounding dwellings, and there is a detached garage on the plot that would be demolished to facilitate access to the rear. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, 
Um, as you can see, there's the existing, this is the uh, existing site plan showing the layout. The protected trees are not shown in this drawing, but they would be to the rear, where you can see the buildings marks on this 48 to 62, they run on that boundary. And the next slide, please. And this one is the proposed plan. You can see the dwelling and, and the attached carriage. While the distance to the boundary from the garden is relatively small, there is sufficient amount of space there to for the uh, impact of any future occupants of the club. And the next slide, please. Here are the proposed front and rear elevations of the single story dwelling. As you can see, it's relatively modest due to the small scale of design. It wouldn't adversely impact on the amenity of any of the surrounding properties. And the next one, please. Again, these are the side elevations. Same applies, it wouldn't reversely impact on the amending of the neighboring properties. The next one, please. Here's the floor plan, as you can see, it's a relatively modest dwelling. And the next one, please. It's just a garage, it's a good sized garage. Um, again, due to its location and size right there in the corner, it wouldn't severely impact on the amending of any of the neighboring properties. And the next one, please. And um, there we are. That's um, it's recommended that this application be approved because it's at a remote scale and it wouldn't have any adverse impact on the character of the area or on the amenity of any neighbor properties. And our tree officer has advised that it wouldn't have a severe or value any negative impact on the adjacent protected trees. Thank you. Can I just. Uh, Members aware, this is reserved matters. We already have outline planning permission for this. Uh, I will just ask one question before we go to Councillor Morris. This application is by a member of staff at Obi and Winston Council, and as such, is that the only reason this has come to this committee? Uh, yes, that's correct. Right. Mr. Gill? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's correct, Chair. Okay. Councillor Morris? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I wanted just to discuss the trees. Uh, you mentioned this uh, protection orders on some of the trees. If we could go back to the drawings, when you showed the picture of the, the building that was going to be built, how close is that to the trees? And the reason I'm asking that is because can we have something in place to ensure that there's protection put around the trees? If it's close, I, I can work out that. To ensure that no damage is done to these trees. I'm not sure whether the trees are far enough away or whether they're on the side of where the building's going to be built, which is why I'm asking the question. Because I couldn't quite make it out. I don't know whether the colour on that focus has gone or something, or it lens needs cleaning. It's just unfortunately not very clear. No, this is a very fair question. That's actually the other way around, where what's needed is informative for the applicant because of the type of trees that are supposed to go in. Some of those protections were removed and they've been replaced from October to February. Because of the type of trees in clay soil, they would absorb a lot of water. So it's the other way around. The foundation of the house needs to be designed in such a way that they wouldn't be adversely affected in the future by the trees. The trees will be completely fine. Just to come back on that, so trees have been, would, would have to be removed to have this bit? No, 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 they have already. Some of those trees have already been removed. Okay, They're so going to be replaced. With what? Because are we going to get replacement trees or are we going to get twigs? No, no, they're, they're being replaced by replacement yeah, trees. Yeah. It's not on the site, it's a separate matter. They were removed as part of works and um, approved to those trees. As part of that, it was conditioned that they'd be replaced. That's happening later this year or in the spring. Right. But they're going to be substantial. Uh, yeah. They're going to be substantial trees that are replaced because pre in previous years we've had people who've played the system and they've took down a, a, a tree that's many, many years old and they've put a twig in that's about the size of my pen. Oh, and they've gone, this is our replacement for it, and we've gone, are you, are you kidding? So I want to make sure that if they've taken these trees that we get a, a decent replacement and not a twig. Oh yeah, well, this is an entirely separate matter. The trees are, are nothing to do with this side, but they're over the boundary, and they were taken out anyway. Because of the, the need to take them out, whereas the trees, they're not, there's no link between this development and the trees. The only issue is that the foundations of this house will have to be designed to accommodate the future growth. Mr. Carr, you wanted to come in? Yeah, it's just to say that as part of the sort of in the application process, other than the council's article list, he's sort of he's asked for comment on all applications that impact trees. And he's as you're probably aware, he's very keen on actually if trees are removed, to actually place it with a 
a species that's, that's going to grow well in that location and also the, the, the sizable, the, the decent size. So it is part of all applications we do consult with the, the agriculture. Pretty good. And the trees that are replaced take the TPO over? That's normal, isn't it? Yeah, yeah if, if the trees are subject to a TPO and they're removed and then replaced, then yes, they will still be protected by the TPO. It's like many things in planning, the TPO runs with the land generally. I was just checking out, just wanted to mention it, I'm sort of knew the answer already, but yeah, thank you. Councillor Gordon? Yes, thank you, Chair. I know that this is reserved matters and that outline planning permission was granted uh, way back in 21. Having said that, when we passed out our permission, we did not see that plan. We did not pass the outline permission. It was done by officers. I'll speak to you afterwards regarding that. Can I then be assured, Chair, that every single policy of this council has been followed and all the T's crossed and the dots been put. I, I have if, you're, if you're asking in relation to this application, um, Council Oidle, the answer is no, the process wasn't correctly followed. The reason the process was not correctly followed was because at the time that the outline planning permission was granted, it was an agency planning officer and it was an agency development control officer who signed it off and they did so on the misunderstanding that it didn't need to come to committee. That of itself does not make that decision void. No. What it means is that that decision was voidable, which means that somebody who objected to it could have mounted a legal challenge in the course at the appropriate time, within three months of the decision being made, now it's too late to do that because they're out of time, they would have to ask for permission. The other point that, that, that we want to make is to reiterate what Councillor um, Bentley said at the outset. The only reason this application is before this committee is because it is a member of staff. The application is policy compliant. It meets all the criteria and if it was anybody other than a member of staff who had put that application in, that application would have been approved under delegated powers. So I have no concerns that this is going to present an issue. Uh, it does show a learning opportunity to make sure that when we do engage agency staff going forward, that we have to make sure that they fully understand the process in respect to members of staff because of the transparency agreements. But I'm, I'm comfortable that this committee can proceed to make that decision and if it's mine to approve this application. Councillor Lloyd? I think one thing in its favour, Chair, is that the neighbours have all been notified and there is not one letter of representation. Okay. Councillor Broadley? Thank you, uh, Chair. Although I'm not happy with uh, people building in gardens, there's nothing I can do about it. It is uh, where we are, where we are. Um, and I do, I do hope that in future uh, that officers will look at applications where people are building in gardens. It's garden grabbing and I'm not over keen on it. Um, but as I say, there's nothing we can do about it, so I will move up for approval. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Wolfsky. Okay, so it's moved, been moved to permit by Councillor Broadley, seconded by Councillor Koswalski. All those in favour of permit? That's unanimous. Application is passed. I believe that's the end of the business for today. Thank you for your attendance and thank you for your input. Very interesting debate. Good night, everybody. You can go and get your air. Uh... And your school is going to be delivered as part of phase two. Sorry,